ever heard of the Sierra Club? If you said yes to any of these, then you should thank John Muir. Muir was born in Scotland, but he grew up in America. He traveled across the United States studying plants and animals. He formed national parks and started an environmentalist organization called Sierra Club. Muir dedicated his life to fulfill his responsibility to defend the rights of others to enjoy nature as he can. John Muir was born in Scotland on April 21, 1835. He was the first son of his family. At age 10, John, his brother David, his sister Sarah, and his father moved to America because his father wished to be a farmer. In America, his family lived on a large farm where John Muir worked for most of his younger life. Despite his father not wanting him to study, Muir secretly taught himself reading, writing, and math from books he had to borrow from his friends. As Muir grew older, he wished to gain freedom from his father. At age 22, much to his father's dismay, Muir left his hometown to attend University of Wisconsin. Even though he had no former schooling, he got in because the college was new and they needed students. To pay for his tuition, Muir recruited others and worked at odd jobs. Since Muir just went to college to learn and not to get a job, he never graduated. He left the university and decided to explore forests in Canada. He stayed there a couple of years doing odd jobs. One was making and improving products at a broom factory. In return for his work, the factory decided to share profits with him. Unfortunately, the factory burned down before he made any profit. The next year, he was at a machine shop in Minneapolis, Indiana. There, a piece of metal pierced his eye, causing temporary blindness. While in the hospital, he realized how he loved viewing nature and how he vowed never again to work in a factory. Instead, he would devote his life to preserve nature because he saw that his responsibility was to protect the rights of others so they could also enjoy the wonders he had seen. When Muir got out of the hospital, he set off on a 1,000-mile journey across the United States. The trip started in Indiana and ended in Florida. While he was in Kentucky, he wrote his address in his notebook as Earth, Planet, Universe, showing a deep understanding that Earth is our home and we must protect it. In January 1868, Muir took a trip to Cuba because he wished to learn about the various plants and animals that live there. While there, he gathered shells and studied wildlife along the beaches of Morro Castle. He only stayed about a month because he became deathly ill. He left for New York to get medical help. After he recovered, he went to California because he had heard the many natural wonders that existed there. Muir spent the next few years studying animals and plants in California. When Muir was studying California's wildlife, he discovered one of America's most beautiful sights. He hiked down the Valley of Yosemite, and when he reached the end, he was overjoyed to find Het Hetchy Falls, a 2,400-foot drop of rushing water. Yosemite became a national park in 1890 because of the articles and books Muir had published on the wonders of Het Hetchy Valley. Through saving Yosemite, John Muir continued his work by preserving Sequoia Woods. He did this by writing articles to representatives in Congress. He also surveyed for the U.S. government during the destruction to the environment caused by logging companies and polluters. When President Grover Cleveland saw Muir's survey, he ordered 21 million acres of land to be protected from logging or any other industry. He also saved the Grand Canyon and the Petrified Forest. Sadly, even though he preserved many beautiful sites, he could not save Hetch Hetchy Falls. After months of violent debate between the Sierra Club and San Francisco's government, in 1913 Congress passed a law requiring the dam to be built on Hetch Hetchy Falls. After this painful loss, Muir was said to lose the will to live, and he died on Christmas Eve, 1914, at the age of 76. Even though John Muir died, his legacy has lived on through an organization he created called the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is devoted to wilderness activities and the protection of nature. The Sierra Club was founded on June 4, 1892 by 162 Californians, including John Muir and other environmentalists from California and across the nation. Today, the Sierra Club voices opinions on saving wildlife. Currently, the Sierra Club provides a powerful voice for environmentalists. One of the issues they have an opinion on is air pollution. Also, they are concerned about genetic engineering and the problems of nuclear waste. Some other issues the Sierra Club discusses are trash transfer, the destruction of wetlands, and the endangerment of species of animals and plants. They take action against these issues by writing letters to members of Congress. All in all, the Sierra Club provides a powerful voice for environmentalists everywhere. As you can easily see, John Muir has been extremely important in saving forests and other natural wonders. From being a child in Wisconsin to becoming an elderly man in California, John Muir devoted his life to the study and preservation of natural
natural wonders. Even after his death, he still affects us because he set up national parks. He also started the Sierra Club, which provides a powerful voice for environmentalists around the world. As you can easily see, Muir devoted his life to uphold the responsibility to preserve the right of posterity to enjoy nature as he had. of the Second Amendment seems straightforward. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep in their arms shall not be infringed. Yet the debate rages on. Does each American citizen have the right to own firearms? The right to bear arms comes with great responsibility to protect yourself and those around you. The foundation of Americans' right to keep and bear arms began with the American struggle for independence from the oppressive British government. After a war in Europe, the British turned its attention to start bringing the colonies more firmly under its control. One of Britain's first actions was the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which restricted the European settlement to the area east of the Application Mountains. In 1765, two more acts, the Stamp Act and the Quarrying Act, were made. These were just a few of the acts that most colonists strongly opposed for the main reason that there was no representation for the colonies in the British Parliament. Strong feelings continued to spread throughout the colonies. As tensions increased, many conflicts between the British and the colonists occurred. On March 5, 1770, there was conflict between the colonists and British soldiers that killed five and wounded many others. This event was used throughout the colonies as propaganda to incite colonists' resentment of Britain. The British soldiers had the right to bear arms, however, they weren't being responsible with their actions. After many other conflicts, the intolerable acts were created to punish the colonies for their behavior. After many diplomatic attempts to get Britain to repel the acts, the colonies decided to go to war. In 1775, the Revolutionary War began. On April 19, 1775, the first battle began. British troops arrived by sea into Boston Harbor, planning to take arms away from the colonies. But Paul Revere was able to warn the colonists of Lexington. Using the guns the British had planned to capture, a small group of colonists attacked the British. The group of 700 British soldiers had a small victory until they moved to Concord, where another group of colonists caused the British to retreat. Since the colonies only had a few armies, many colonists had to be armed and prepared in a minute's notice. So thus they became known as many men. These men had the right to bear arms, but they had the responsibility to protect the colonies. After the war, the new country needed to develop a government. They remembered all the problems with England and did not want to repeat them with their new constitution. In the Second Amendment, the Founding Fathers gave the right to the people to own guns. One commentary on the Bill of Rights, published anonymously in the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1788, asked, Who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Congress has no right to disarm the militia. It is the birthright of American. The unlimited power should not be in the hands of the federal government, but in the hands of the people. This shows that the people in the colonies had the right to bear arms and were willing to accept responsibility, rather than giving it to the government. Currently, the debate that started with the Founding Fathers is continuing. However, instead of campaigning for citizens who have the right to keep and bear arms, many Americans would like to see guns banned, claiming the citizens who own weapons aren't responsible enough. The main reason people oppose guns is that they are often used to kill people. Over 1,500 Americans die annually in accidental shootings. Guns also cause 19,600 murders annually. In at least 3 out of 10 violent crimes, criminals use guns against their victims. Many people believe that gun control is the solution to the gun violence problem. The goal of gun control is to make it harder for criminals to get guns. 
Some promoters of gun control say that people simply do not have the right to own guns. Their interpretation of the Second Amendment does not guarantee the private citizen to own a gun. Others believe that the Second Amendment does give some rights, but since there is little fear of the abusive federal government oppressing citizens, the Second Amendment should be discarded. The anti-gun control side of the debate argues that gun control would make crimes worse because criminals will become bolder if they know less people have guns. They also argue that in violent crimes, victims are more than twice as likely to walk away from a crime unharmed if they have a gun. This debate goes back to the Founding Fathers when Thomas Jefferson stated in his book, Commonplace, Laws that forbid the carrying of arms serve rather to encourage than to prevent homicide, for an unarmed man may be attacked with greater confidence than an armed man. Many citizens believe that they should not have the right to keep and bear arms taken away because of other irresponsible people. Many deaths that involve guns are careless mistakes. Children are one such example. Many parents take the right to own a gun, but are not responsible with it. Some irresponsible parents keep guns where children can get to them, and many more don't need to walk under guns. Almost everyone that is on the anti-gun control side of the debate believes that the Founding Fathers want citizens to be able to bear arms, and that they intended for the Second Amendment to give that right. They want guns to be a source of protection against governments, even if it was the United States itself. If our own government ever got corrupt and took away rights, the people would be able to protect their rights. But if no one takes responsibility to protect the citizens' rights, the Bill of Rights is liable to fall. Many citizens that oppose gun control have fought hard to make sure that there are very little gun control laws. One of the reasons is that many people have died to protect the Constitution. If we take away the rights to have guns, their deaths have been in vain. The Supreme Court has ruled many times that the Constitution does not prohibit most gun control laws until the Brady Bill. The Brady Bill, which required background checks on gun purchases and a five-day waiting period, was implemented on February 28, 1994. Three years later, the bill was found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, not for gun control reasons, but that it would violate the balance of power between Congress and the states to require local police to run background checks. On December of 1998, an amendment to the Brady Bill replaced the five business day waiting period with the National Instant Felon ID System. John Locke's crime study found mixed results about the bill. There are occasions where enraged people buy a gun and quickly proceed to commit a crime with it. There are also occasions where people attempt to purchase guns for self-protection because they have been threatened, and they are murdered during the waiting period. In short, the Brady Bill has fallen short of protecting citizens from illegal gun use, while still allowing responsible use. The debate over the Second Amendment will continue to rage on. On one side, historical evidence clearly shows that the Second Amendment was intended as a personal right to keep and bear arms. On the other side of the issue, some conclude that the Second Amendment protects only the right of the people to maintain an effective militia. In other words, the amendment doesn't protect individual rights at all. What really lies behind the conflict is how much power does the government have to regulate individual conduct. The Founders' answer to the question was plain. The Constitution comes down squarely on the side of limited government and individual liberty. What would you think if you heard obscene language in the music some people listen to? Many people will be very offended by this, but other people and the musicians that made the music are using their First Amendment rights and they will be very offended by those words being removed from the music. Musicians have the right to say what they want in their music without words being taken out. Many musicians use music as a way to express their feelings but parents would be very offended if their child was listening to that music and being influenced by foul language and thoughts of hate.
Because of rap music, young children pick up bad messages and are influenced by the lyrics of the song and should not be exposed to uncensored music. The lyrics of most rap songs have messages of violence, sex, drugs, and hate. These songs are not taken seriously most of the time. They are usually taken as a joke. The lyrics of these songs are intended for audiences of 18 years or older and not for people under 18. The rappers are aware that young people are being influenced by the music, but their target audience is older. However, there has been no proof that the lyrics of his songs fully influence people. Even though the target audience for most rap and heavy rock music is 18, children still get a hold of music and are influenced by it. To try and censor and restrict music, the Recording Industry Association of America created a parental advisory label to restrict the sales of certain albums. There have been many different bills on music censorship that have tried to pass but were denied because of the First Amendment. Instead of censoring music, there are other ways to prevent inappropriate lyrics from being heard. One of those ways is to edit the lyrics or beep out the bad words in a song. The worst way of censoring music is to ban an album from being sold. There is no good solution to censoring music. If you don't like what's on a CD, just don't buy it. The labels on CDs are designed to parents to know what is on a CD, but that could contain a minimum of five words which might not be much to some parents' judgment. So labels are not very specific on what is on a CD. Because of censorship, it is hard or impossible for some artists to completely express their feelings. Music is an artist's way of expressing their feelings. A musician has as many rights as a painter does, so if paintings aren't censored, why should music be? Many people believe music should be censored because of the lyrics in a song, but many other people believe that musicians should have the right to say what they want. Some musicians need to limit what they say in some music. Even though they have the right to say whatever they want, most musicians don't think of who will be listening to their music while they write a song, so it is hard to limit what they say. Some musicians don't like to be limited on what they say. If you were a musician, how would you feel if you couldn't utilize your freedom of speech? Musicians, like all other people, have freedom of speech rights. Musicians should be able to express themselves and say what they want on an album. I disapprove of what Live 2 crew raps, but I will defend to the death the group's right to rap it, says lawyer Clarence Page. Many rappers rap to tell the story of something. We had to sing away our problems and to help things get better, says Sean Puffy Combs. Eminem and other rappers rap to tell the story of their life and use offensive language to express the pain they went through in their life. To try and censor out this music feels like taking the violence out of a war movie, which depends on violence to express the story. Rap and other music is not about promoting violence, sex, and hate. It's about an artist telling a story and a song. Many people think the world of rap music is a violent, gangster-ridden world, but that's not true. Even though most of the time musicians are telling a story through music, it can be too much for young children to handle. Think about it. If you were a parent, would you read a war novel to a young child? Just like any other American, musicians have the same rights as everyone else. One of those rights is the freedom of speech. Everybody is guaranteed free speech according to the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights. But when some musicians take full advantage of this right, certain people get upset. Certain groups like the RIA, or Recording Industry Association of America, are taking away artists' freedom of speech rights by censoring and labeling certain music. Artists have the right to create music they believe in and not have it censored. Labeling laws would be an unconstitutional restriction on the First Amendment. But what if you were a parent with young, impressionable children? Would you want a musician to say whatever they want in front of your children? Probably not. So in some way, children should be protected from some music. Although some people think it is easy to censor a CD, it is not. The record companies are the ones who choose and judge what should be censored. 
They are also in charge of making edited versions of CDs. The musicians are not in charge of editing the lyrics of a song for bla bad language. The other part of censorship is the music source. If an album is labeled with an explicit language label, it is a record store's choice if they want to sell a labeled CD. Most record stores that sell labeled CDs have policies that they can't sell a labeled CD to anyone without an ID and under 18. In South Carolina, the charge for selling a labeled CD to any underage person is $50,000 and 10 years in jail for the seller of the CD. Censorship makes record companies think harder about the message they are sending out on what they produce. Edited and labeled CDs are designed to protect children from bad language and bad influences. It's a record company's right to judge a CD, and it's also a parent's right to judge a CD and see if it's appropriate for their children. Today, it's almost impossible for anyone underage to buy a labeled CD. Most people need to recognize that musicians can say whatever they want without being censored. People also need to think of what musicians believe about censorship. Censorship takes away from the story that musicians and rappers tell in their songs. Censoring music would take away from mu a musician's freedom of speech. If you don't like what is on a CD, just don't buy it. But parents have the responsibility to make sure their child doesn't listen to anything that parents don't approve of. Even if musicians have most of the rights, parents need to take the responsibility.